more. Get my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive. Six, seven, eight, feeling great. Nine, I'm gonna shine. Life is good. I'm doing fine. Ten, gonna do it right and do it again. Yeah. I look into the sky with all the beautiful color, but there's more than just for me, so gonna share it with another. I got to show, to give, let out. I want to sing and shout. Take a look and see a beautiful morning that turns into a beautiful evening, and together make a beautiful life. And if you wanna see, then come along with me. That's right. And if you wanna Welcome to Experience Michiana. Today we're going from the west side of Michiana to the east side. We have so many great things to share with you. Dave had an opportunity to check out the Tipsy Biscuit. I'm so excited for that. I've wanted to try that for so long. He's going to tell you all about that over in Elkhart, Indiana. Then I also had the chance to talk to the LaPorte County Symphony Orchestra. They're celebrating 50 years. We're going to tell you more about their upcoming performance. But first up, today I'm standing in front of the Lubeznik Center for the Arts in Michigan City, Indiana. They have a wonderful art display that is going to begin with their opening reception coming up this Friday. You don't want to miss this one either. Check it out. Well, today we're in Michigan City, Indiana, and I'm so excited to see this beautiful display that you have here. The Lubeznik Center for the Arts has an upcoming exhibition. I know some of it's a work in progress. We're getting a little sneak peek, if you will. Janet, thanks so much for showing us around. Absolutely. Thank you for coming here today. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And this was all collaborated by a visiting um, curator, correct? Yes, we have. Um, so we have our own curator at the center. But we had asked a guest curator, her name is Sam Kirk, and um, she's, from, she's a Chicagoan, and she is primarily known as muralist, but she's a designer, she's done books, um, she's done major murals for uh, large companies. And we asked her, because she's very hooked into a group of artists in Chicago that do work that is um, like a social practice. They mm -hmm. each have some sort of ties with community and do things that help our community. So she is our guest curator. Wonderful. And everything here that we're seeing, it's very complex. Now the name of this uh, exhibit is Citizen. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about what that means. So Sam, uh, we really gave her some free reign about what kind of show she would like to curate. And so it's been in the making for two years. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and um, what I think, you know, we always at Lubeznik Center like to show work that's relevant to our community, mm -hmm. relevant to the conversations that are happening in the world, not just not just in our own little community, Absolutely. but but that as well. And so um, this whole idea about citizenship, what does that actually mean? What does it mean officially to be a citizen of the U.S. or of a country? What is the idea of what kind of rights are afforded mm -hmm. to various people? Um, and really Sam's mission in her work as a curator and an artist is to raise people's voices who have maybe previously or are marginalized okay. and not given opportunity, especially in a facility like this. Absolutely. And it's not just the art that's displayed, but it's the artists themselves too, correct? Um, well, right, yes, because a lot of, them, I think that Sam said that most all of these artists have never been in any kind of museum-like setting really? before. Really? Okay. So, well, um, it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It's museum quality work, but, but that's a great example just in the art world itself, how things um, have not, obviously, if you go to a museum, you won't always see work by artists of, um, various colors. I mean, it's only recently that museums started to collect mm -hmm. work by African American artists, both historic and contemporary. So, so there is a change that's happening that's, a, that's wonderful it's and we want to celebrate shift. that. Yeah, yeah, it is a wonderful shift. Um, but it also celebrates the voices of women. It's really about all people, um, people in the LGBTQ community, who maybe um, are, there, are their rights being threatened? Mm -hmm. What are their should their rights be the same? It doesn't. I don't think that all the work, the voice of the institution is more neutral. Mm -hmm. We let the voices of the artists do mm -hmm. the talking. Yeah, and this is one of the pieces that we're standing yes. in front of, which is just a beautiful piece too. And if you split it down the middle, you can kind of see the difference. Explain a little bit more about this piece. Sure. This piece is by Sergio Maciel, and. Um, and it's called Fresh Air. Okay. And it speaks to a particular issue in Chicago. You can see the Chicago landscape with yeah. the Sears, or the Willis Tower <laughs> and the Hancock Building. Um, and on the left side of the, of the painting, you see 
a young white boy like who's blue a, fresh water exactly and blowing bubbles in the air um, in a blue sky and on the other side you see a young black girl who has a gas mask on and is um, this piece is really talking about environmental justice and mm -hmm. how different classes of people economically experience um, econo or environmental justice. So um, I think particularly this is about um, a particular uh, manufacturer or um, plant that was in Lincoln Park and residents have complained and they're shuttering mm -hmm. the Lincoln Park plant and they want to bring it uh, they want to bring the plant to Little Village. So, uh -huh. okay. um, so it's really an example of, you know, where are we going to put our plants is yeah. where poor people live. Right. Um, and it's a protest piece. It is. So, it's it's yeah. beautiful and it's done very well. And I, I, you know, you can feel it, you can see it, you can embrace it. Right. And we do like to pride ourselves on, you know, being really accessible not just that we're free six days a week and we're free to schools oh, and we have tours for adults that are free um, but that the pieces themselves there are always some pieces that are more accessible to bring you into the subject mm -hmm. and then all of the tags that will be up when you actually see the yes show. We're, we're, right. we're getting the sneak we're in peek process <laughs> right <laughs> now but you know but we try to also have um, an education that's not like art speak, that's not, that really, that takes into account that our community, many are who very, are very art sophisticated, but many who might not really know or, or be that interest, think they're not that interested in the mm -hmm. arts, have a way in. Absolutely. And I know there's another piece. Can we go check out the sure. other one too? Sure. Okay. So this piece itself is done by the curator herself, Sam Kirk. It is, and it's very typical of her style of illustration and her mural work. Um, this piece is particularly supposed to be uplifting mm -hmm. black and uh, voices and women's voices. Um, so I'm sure that some of you noticed the Black Panther Party patch on the jacket, which is actually three-dimensional. It there. is. There's, there's texture to it's it. It's very cool, yes. and. Um, the Black Panther Party actually started as a way to, it was supposed to be a breakfast program for uh, impoverished children on the south and west sides of Chicago. And it also was meant to um, fulfill after school commitments and things. So it became a politicized movement mm -hmm. much later and mm -hmm. much more radicalized. But really the, the sentiment behind it was that um, was that the women behind the Panther Party really wanted to do a lot of the the grassroots work to sure. change community. Yeah, and that's kind of what's going on here too with the citizen uh, display. Also, not not just painting artwork, but you also have some textile. What other kind of artistry do you have? So we have textile, which is really fabulous. Um, we even have photographs on textile, but we also have um, in our installation room upstairs. We have an artist, Denise Ruiz, who has um, created an environment upstairs that's all about healing mm -hmm. and that's all about, um, it's got eucalyptus plants. Which you so can it's smell fragrant. from here. Right. right. It <laughs> you can smell it through the camera. It's <laughs> unbelievable how wonderful it smells. Yeah. So it's really all about um, a, a comfort and healing of your senses. And so it has an uplifting factor to it. Um, it's not only, you know, all of the things that are wrong. It's about what people are doing to heal mm -hmm. their communities. Absolutely. So, yeah, when people see that room and smell it and hear it, they're going to go wild. That's it's beautiful. Wonderful. <laughs> well, you guys got a little bit of a sneak peek. There's many more items to see here. When can people come? So, um, on Friday, March 3rd, is our opening from 5 to 8. We are always free, so check our hours on our website. It's um, five to eight, we have, the artists will be present and we always have food. We have another artist who's in our community galleries named Neil Gaynor, who's a young Indi Northwest Indiana artist. Um, we have on March 11th at 1130 on Saturday, I'll be giving the directors talk about the work and we also have a sign language interpreter 
for that day. Great. So please, for anybody in the um, deaf or hard of hearing community, please come out and know that. Um, and then you can call us for a tour. We will have a family day later in June. So they're always free and people can, you know, they, they really are wonderful programs that people enjoy and take advantage of. So we hope your South Bend community will come out. Uh, yeah, all across Michigan is definitely many reasons to get here. You know, such beautiful displays. Oh, so. and I should say, Five to eight central time. Yes, important. <laughs> We're in Michigan City. We're on central that. time. Yes. <laughs> Do keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for showing thank us. Thank you. I appreciate thank it. You. Thanks so much. <laughs>so my mom was here from Ireland over the last couple of weeks and I put on Facebook where should we bring her for breakfast that we haven't been before and the biggest reaction was the tipsy biscuit so I'm here with James who's the owner of the tipsy biscuit now James uh, your professional past has actually been in restaurants and places around the South Bend area yes it has been uh, my family has owned a few bars throughout my childhood here in Elkhart but my adult serving career was mostly in South Bend places like Fiddler's Hearth Tapestry that was around in the Morris uh, yeah. kind of downstairs for a while um, so I've you know some fine dining some nightclub bartending for Notre Dame students and all that stuff but when we decided to get this place we wanted to concentrate on like our family's West Virginia homemade breakfast so so yeah how did the Tipsy Biscuit come about for you how well, did you make the leap going from working for someone else to working for yourself my family has been in this area since the 60s but when we moved here I probably like 1993 uh, we really missed homemade breakfast, which is you've got a lot of like greasy spoon diners in this area and they're fantastic, but we really missed the culturally breakfast is huge for yeah. people from West Virginia and Appalachia in general. And we just really missed that homemade biscuits, homemade gravy, um, that kind of hug from your grandma that that kind of food <laughs> gives you. So we really wanted to put our stamp and, and make a place where you could really come and get that homemade food and there was uh, kind of a hole in the market for it. So. And you know, one of my best friends actually, his family is uh, from West Virginia and they moved here back at probably about the same time as your family because there was no jobs and they came here looking for jobs in the, in the factories. There was a big here. exodus in yeah. the, to this area for manufacturing jobs once the coal mining kind of started to go down a little yeah. bit. So there are a lot of people from that area yeah. that live specifically here in Elkhart, but definitely in Indiana. Yeah, so uh, why did you choose this location? This was just available. We weren't really even looking to open something. I was working somewhere else. My sister was working somewhere else. My mom happened to drive by one day and noticed <laughs> that it was for sale. She came in and chatted with the people that were selling it. Um, they actually had somebody else on the line that was going to buy it, but they really liked my mom and she <laughs> talked them into uh, selling it to us instead. And we just kind of were like, okay, let's open a breakfast restaurant, I guess. So <laughs> it was about a three month process of us putting a menu together, uh, kind of redoing the inside for our kind of uh, Hanna-Barbera Flintstone meets grandma's <laughs> kitchen kind of vibe and uh, we really were kind of dead set on being a very slow kind of like slow burn people would find out about us as we you know our food got more popular kind of place and it wasn't like that at all it was just literally just <laughs> like swamped the moment we even did our soft open and we kind of had to restructure our whole idea about how we were going to run this place right off the bat so yeah so for one thing you know um, the place is is absolutely beautiful I love the decoration it feels very homely actually you know which I love about it and um, but you know it's not the biggest building uh, in the town so yeah. Yeah. you know you've, you've obviously had to restructure that you don't want people waiting too long so what have you done with that well yeah like I said when we first opened it we were planning on running this as a literal mom and pop situation it was just going to be the three of us plus maybe a couple other family members mm -hmm. and a friend or two you know here and there but once we realized that there was clearly a market for what was happening here, we had to hire a bunch more people um, and figure out ways to uh, kind of manipulate this space to fit the large numbers of people that were wanting to come in and eat. So we've gone from doing 
walk-in only uh, phone off the hook, no <laughs> reservations, no call ahead, no to goes through the pandemic, which allowed us to kind of like reset and fix that mm -hmm. so that we do take call ahead seating and reservations. Uh, as far ahead of time as I've got a calendar, you can make a reservation. As far as about an hour in advance, you can call ahead to get on the list to wait in the mornings. So, Which is kind of unusual for breakfast places to want to do that. They do get busy and they do have a wait, but I don't think people are calling to like see if they can get in for yeah. the day. Uh, usually they have a bigger footprint and a few more tables, so I think that works out. But we only have 13 spots in the whole restaurant and only two tables that seat more than four people. So it does, um, it is kind of like a game of Tetris every day to mm -hmm. try and uh, figure out where to put everyone, how to, how to put them into this tiny space. And also to, we do a lot of um, conversing with people to let them know like, this is what we do, this is why we do it. Yeah, you can't wait inside, we'll give you a phone call, go run an errand, you will get yeah. your call, you will get your table. Um, and it is, it's a learning process as we go, even three years in, I still change things every once in a while mm -hmm. to try and suit the business, you know. As soon as you think you have it figured out, you know. We, <laughs> you know, the weekends used to be the time we only really had a wait list, but now we even have a wait list on Thursday and Friday. Nice. Uh, so, you know, like th those where the changes come in yeah. and, uh, you know, we're constantly rearranging or I'll find a table at a resale shop that kind of maybe mm -hmm. fits better for what we do here and I'll kind of move a table out, move furniture around and just kind of work it in, work people in wherever we can as safely as we can. I think you can tell a lot about a place by how you're greeted when you walked in. Now I walked in the front door, you had no idea that I was the person here to interview you. And the second I walked in, you turn around, big smile and said, hey, how are you? Like, welcome in. And, and that's a big part of that kind of West Virginian hospitality, it is, right? It's something that you, um, I grew up very used to and it kind of was a culture shock here that people aren't really as kind of chatty um, in this area. but. We do kind of make sure that everyone is spoken to and acknowledged as, as, as well as we can with how crazy it gets in here sometimes. Uh, mostly just because we're trying to set a tone in here and we really do want it to feel like you're in your grandma's kitchen, you're in a family member's home, you are getting special treatment. Everything we do and serve here is kind of over the top for that reason because it's you know whenever you stayed the night at your grandma's house she would do crazy things that were special that no one else did for you whether it was how she seasoned her food or gave you a hot cup of cocoa or any of kind of those things and that's kind of the vibe that we go for so it's love it, it really is and there is love in everything my, you'll you, you hear my mom actually say that a lot when she's running yeah. around is there is a lot of love put in stuff and that's kind of why we can't really expand because you kind of can't find people that can put that kind of touch on stuff mm -hmm. that you're that you yourself do and we are working owners so we do that work ourselves here as well so if you had to pick I, I told you uh, before I text a friend of mine who lives down the street and she keeps telling me you got to come here she said chicken and waffles is what I had to get what, what's the one item that you think is that the is most popular? That is a dish popular? that is, is well known. So uh, we have two versions of that. We have our savory version, which is a cornbread and cheddar mm -hmm. sweet waffle yes. uh, with homemade jalapeno relish uh, and roasted corn. Um, and then we also have a sweet version, which is like a pearl sugar waffle that has a strawberry glaze and fresh berries on it. We keep fresh berries in house all year round, no matter what the season is. Um, but I would say Biscuit isn't our name for a reason. You're not gonna. You're, you're gonna be hard pressed to find a homemade biscuit at a restaurant. I'm sure there are some people that do it, um, but it's it's a tough. Um, it's tough to master them. Once you master them, you realize they aren't that difficult. But you really do have to work with them mm -hmm. to understand how what a biscuit is, especially an American biscuit. Like it's a. It, you've got five different kinds. Some people roll them. Some people don't roll them. Some people drop them out of a spoon. There's uh, very specific kind of techniques that you use to make them. Um, they don't stay uh, fresh very long, so you have to kind of constantly be making biscuits throughout yeah. the day uh, to be, you know, their best. So try the biscuits at the Tipsy Biscuit. That is, there's a reason why it's in our name. Uh, we also do some really excellent uh, scratch food like our homemade corned beef hash. And yeah, chicken and waffle, anything with chicken on it here is really good. So biscuits in your name, but I noticed Tipsy is as well. So yes. what's that? So what's that here part? on the Riverwalk, we qualified for a kind of city sponsored liquor license that we just kind of have to kind of essentially rent from them uh, while we're in this space. So we thought, why not utilize it? There's nothing around here. Um, like in cities like Chicago and Indianapolis and Grand Rapids that where you can go get brunch, but also cocktails. Yeah. So we really wanted to kind of take that and add that to our kind of what we do that's different. Yeah. 
and then have another aspect of something that's different on top of it. So we do specialty cocktails, uh, most are craft cocktails, so they're not things you're really going to find at other places either. Mm -hmm. uh, mimosa based usually, but we have some really great Bloody Marys that are made completely from scratch um, and a few other kind of like um, a little bit of something for everyone, savory and sweet and a little bit of interesting stuff with flowers and herbaceous kind of ingredients too. I like it. Well, I hope people check it out. Uh, you're here on Main Street in Elkhart. Uh, yes, and we're open Thursday through Sunday, 9 to 2. Those are some pretty specific hours for a breakfast place, but yep. that's how we roll. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. Uh, it's a little different than most places that are open like 6 to 2, but yep. uh, we found our kind of pocket that we fit into that really works well for us. So. Hey, perfect. All right. Well, thanks for showing me around, and I can't wait to eat here. Oh, no problem, guys. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate it. Today we're over in LaPorte County as the LaPorte County Symphony Orchestra continues their 50 year celebration. I have Tim King with us here today. This is another amazing event that you have coming up with the Performing Arts and you're in a unique space here. Yes. Is, tell me more about this. Well, this is the Holdcraft Performing Arts Center in Michigan City. <clears throat> it used to be a high school here uh, and they've uh, converted this and kept the space here. Uh, Stan Holcraft and uh, a team of people with him. He actually stands still with us and they named oh, it after him okay. actually. So we like this venue because the sound is really good mm -hmm. and there's only one level as you can see out here. Yeah. It holds a little bit less than 700 people and our subscribers love it because there's no steps anywhere oh. coming into the building, <laughs> coming into the yes. hall. But this is what we, this is probably the most classical concert we have of, of the entire season. Okay. We have four subscription concerts. This is the third out of four. It's going to be Sunday, March the 12th at 3 p.m. And I want to remind people that that's the first day of daylight savings time. Okay. And it is central time. It is central, central time. time is Thank still you. still switching with daylight savings. That's this right. Year so there's the two County. things okay. you've got to worry about there, right? Central time and daylight savings time. So 3 p.m. Our music director, Dr. Carolyn Watson, will be leading the orchestra right here on the stage, and we'll be welcoming guest pianist Michael Chertok. And okay. Mike is the chair of the piano department at the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. Oh, wow. And Fantastic. has soloed with many, many orchestras, Philadelphia, New York, San Francisco, Toronto. Um, just a great, great guy. So he's going to be soloing yeah. with us um, on the concert as well. And this is a very unique concert in particular because this is kind of a, a really big celebration. The pictures of an yes. uh, in an exhibition. Yes, okay. right. So the, the, the concert's going to be four pieces. We actually start with Borodine in the steps of Central Asia, which was a piece that the orchestra played on the very first season 50 years ago. It's oh, a late wow. romantic 19th century piece. Beautiful piece of music. Okay. The second piece of music is by a living Australian composer whose name is Elena Katz Chernin. And sometimes when you think c contemporary music, you think, oh, I'm not going to like this at all. Right, They're, yeah, sure. <laughs> this is a really, really sweet four and a half minute piece of music that she wrote after she visited a young cancer ward in mm. Australia. Australia, and she wanted these kids to think of nothing but happy thoughts. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's called The Dance of the Paper Umbrellas. So it's probably very called. light. Oh, nature. very light and just sure. gorgeous piece of music. And then Mr. Chirk Doc comes on, Mike comes on, and he'll be doing the okay. Prokofiev Piano Concerto Number no. One, yeah. which Prokofiev composed when he was only 17 years old. Oh my gosh. But it's a very fiendishly difficult piece of music. I was listening music. to some of it before I came here too, just because I wanted to hear some of the music. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It is. It's a really great piece of music with a great ending too. We always love that. Yeah. And then the second half is the pictures at an exhibition. Okay. which was written by the Russian composer Mazorsky, but was originally intended as a piano piece of music. And then the French composer Maurice Ravel uh, orchestrated it. Mm -hmm. It's now become a standard piece uh, of music in an orchestra. And what it does, it is depicts 10 different pictures in a Russian museum. Oh, um, okay. And, and a lot of people will think it's 10 movements and people will think, oh gosh, 10 movements, that's way, way, way too long for me. But all the movements are two and three and four minutes a piece. Okay. They're, not, gotcha. they're not long at all. And you will, the, our audience will, probably if they don't know the music, they'll recognize it because they've heard Ooh. it in commercials, they've heard it in TV shows, they've heard it just as background music. So that's the concert for Sunday, March the 12th. And is there a visual component with it too then? Well, what we're going to do is um, over here on the side of the stage, we have a lot of room where we, put, we set a screen up and um, during intermission, maybe prior to the concert and during intermission, we're going to show images of the 50 years of the LaPorte County Symphony That's Orchestra, great. starting with 1974 through present day. We put together a 50th anniversary booklet 
um, okay. that has these pictures and basically we're just gonna draw the photos from that booklet That's that great. people can enjoy during during the intermission and then of course we'll have the booklet for sale ah, um, after you can get your own to take home <laughs> at the end of the concert that they can take with them right and now as far as the orchestra members themselves do you know if any of them have been here for close to those 50 years we have one member really? we do our principal horn player her name's Joe Fran Bendix and she is celebrating her 50th year with the orchestra That's and we've made amazing. a big deal about it because you know in the orchestra world 50 years is unheard of. I mean, it just because you, it's hard to keep an instrument well, you up. you become arthritic at some point. <laughs> <laughs> and a horn player on top of that, because horn is considered one of the most difficult instruments mm -hmm. to play. Sure. So she, she, uh, she's our, our hornist, and so we've had a wonderful time celebrating her. And then, of course, we have several other musicians that have been in the orchestra 20 years or more, probably 20 of them. Wow. But the other, the flip side of that that I like to tell people is we have 18 people in our orchestra who are under the age of 30. Okay. So it's nice. We have a really nice diversity yeah. of ages. But yes, we do have one member that's been here all 50 years. That's so great. And I always talk about how important performing arts is. And, yeah. you know, that's something that I think you guys especially are doing here being in Michigan City for this mm -hmm. event. How does that, uh, how, do, how do you feel about expanding that throughout the entire county? Well, our part of our mission is to reach the whole county because we are called the LaPorte County Symphony right. Orchestra. So we don't, we have most of our concerts at the Civic Auditorium in LaPorte. But, but this year we branched out. It's for instance, in February, we performed a concert at the new high school auditorium, which is nicer than a high school auditorium. <laughs> it's, a, it's like a performing arts center. Yeah. It's relatively new. And then we always love coming to this space because the sound is really good. Mm -hmm. And we want to make a conscious attempt to come to Michigan City because it's another, you know, there's a port in Michigan City are the two big towns sure. in LaPorte County. And then during the summer, we usually do a, an outdoor concert at Friendship Botanic Gardens, yeah, which is also okay. located in Michigan City. Awesome. And what other events do you guys have coming up? Well, we have one more concert, uh, actually two more, okay. um, but one more subscription concert and that will be April the 22nd uh, at the Civic Auditorium, and we're going to be welcoming the Purdue Varsity Glee Club oh. and the Texas Tenors. So oh, it's going to be a huge blowout concert in the Civic Auditorium. And then on July the 16th, we're going to be doing a, uh, presenting a free concert, be our last concert of the 50th anniversary at Friendship Botanic Gardens Perfect. here in Michigan City. Awesome. Well, where can people get more information? How can they get their tickets? Uh, for this concert, March the 12th, just go to our website. It's lcso.net, um, or they can buy tickets at the door. We'll probably have some tickets available at the door. The tickets are 22 for adults, 20 for seniors, 60 and over, Great. and students get free admission as long as they have a pass. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. You know, continuing that performing arts and working into the next generation for the next 50 years. Absolutely. That's And we also have five student apprentices in our orchestra that are high school students Amazing. that have become a member of the orchestra for the entire year. What a great thing to support in our community. Thank I you. hope many people come out to your event. Then. So do I. <laughs> Well, I'm so excited for the symphony orchestra to be displaying their wonderful talents and there's so much to do around here in Michigan. We hope that you'll join us and join the Michigan community as we continue to experience the area. Next week, we actually get to go to Southgate Crossing, one of my favorite places to shop around to. So we're going to take you there. But for now, we'll see you next week. Experience Michiana is made possible in part by the Community Foundation of St. Joseph County and the Indiana Arts Commission, which receives support from the State of Indiana and the National Endowment for the Arts. This WNIT local production has been made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.